Hi, and welcome to Failureology, a podcast about engineering failures. I'm your host, Nicole. And I'm Brian, and we're both from Calgary, Alberta, Canada. We also have an extra special guest joining us today, Alonzo, who's an engineer from Calgary. Hey, everyone. Happy to be here. Alonzo, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your history with Piper Alpha? Sure. I'm a geomax engineer, actually, with an energy company here in Calgary. And how I got to know about the Piper Alpha disaster was about five years ago. I was asked by a cross-discipline team to do a safety presentation because this team was creating a pretty important process for my company. I won't get into all the details of it. And so the organizer of the meeting had asked me to present about a process disaster. And in my research, that's when I discovered Piper Alpha. I was actually asked to do two, and Piper Alpha was one of them. And the reason why, as you can see, why they wanted to present to this team was to show them how important it is to develop a process that has very little flaws and can be properly executed. Because Piper Alpha is a sad example of what happens when a flawed process and poor execution you know, meet and create disastrous consequences. It's definitely disastrous. And you all are about to find out why. Uh, do, Alonzo, do you mind if we share a link to your presentation in our show notes? I think it's, uh, it's really well done and it's really cool to look at. Yeah, of course. In fact, uh, I actually updated the original older presentation specifically for Failureology and your audience. Awesome. Thank you. The presentation also includes uh, maps and some visuals that are really helpful to understand everything going on. Uh, and also, and we're going to talk about this, there's a few different rigs at play and they're all at various parts in the North Sea. So it, uh, the pictures in there help to figure out where everything is related to everything else. So we'll throw a link to that in the show notes. As always, we do want to take a second to thank our Patreon subscribers. For less than the cost of your university calculator, probably much less than the cost of your university calculator, you can hear us talk about more interesting engineering failures. That's right. For just $5 a month, you get double the content, including way more train and plane tangents. We're, we're also working on some episodes that are about trains and planes, which is also really cool. Those are fun. And we even did an extra bonus episode on the harrowing tale of Trans-American Flight 209 that was featured in the 1980 documentary Airplane. Yeah, surely you can't be serious. I am serious. Don't call me Shirley. Also, a uh, quick shout out for you guys. Uh, also to the engineering associations across the world, professional and student, this is your chance to actually support a really good engineering podcast for really what is $5 Canadian a month. So I suggest you do. I don't even know if $5 Canadian gets you a, a cup of coffee that's not just a regular black cup of coffee. Like if you want to add anything <laughs> fancy to it, I'm pretty sure that puts it up above $5. Yeah, agreed. And I developed the concept for the show while studying for the engineering ethics exam while reading an ethics textbook. So, um, you know, our, our heart is in engineering and I, I hope we're bringing a lot of value to to all the people out there, especially students who may not have heard of some of these stories or who kind of don't always know what they're walking into. Alonzo, how'd you find our show? Actually, a while ago, I had read some article, I'm pretty sure it was on LinkedIn, and it had mentioned you and the podcast. So I went and checked it out. And so I've been listening, I think it was a few episodes before Brian joined. But that's how I actually I found Failureology was, hey, there's a local Calgary engineering podcast. And I've been listening pretty regularly ever since. Excellent. That's so cool. Thanks for listening and supporting our show. And thanks for joining us on this show to talk to us about Piper Alpha. That is, that is very cool. You went from a, from a listener to somebody that's now on our show. Yeah. I think, you know, as much as I do love talking about these failures and all of the ridiculous problems that happen, meeting people that listen to the show and connecting with them and talking about these failures is a really, really exciting part of making the show. So thank you. You're welcome. So before we get to the failure, I do have something I want to plug. Very exciting news. European listeners, especially those in Ireland, I'll be in Dublin presenting at Shippicon on Friday, September 2nd. Yes, in person presenting. And I'll be talking about software related engineering failures. After all, it is a software conference. And I'm so, so, so excited to be part of this fantastic conference. And I'm hoping to meet a few of you in person since we can do that again, almost, I think. 
So if you're in Dublin or near Dublin or you're interested in going to Dublin, get your tickets to the conference. Again, I'll be there talking about software related engineering failures. If you can't attend in person, you can also attend virtually and early bird tickets are only 75 euro, which is a really great price for a full day of conference sessions. I've been to a lot of conferences that are very expensive. $75 is a great deal. And the theme of this year's conference is resilience, which ties in very nicely to all the things we talk about here on the podcast. So again, I'm very excited. I hope to see you there. And please check out the link in the show notes where you can register. That sounds very cool. Yeah, I hope some of you get to meet Nicole in person when she goes to the conference or at least see what she talks about online. That, that is very cool. Way to go, Nicole. Thanks. Now, on to this week's engineering failure, the Piper Alpha. Piper Alpha was an offshore oil platform in the North Sea, 190 kilometers northeast of Aberdeen, Scotland, and it was located in 144 meters of water, or I guess in water with a depth of 144 meters. Piper Alpha was built as four modules separated by firewalls. The initial layout had the most dangerous platform operations taking place furthest from personnel areas. Seems like a pretty good design there. Piper Alpha was operated by Occidental Petroleum Caledonia Limited and began production in 1976. The operation was a joint venture of four companies who obtained an oil exploration license in 1972. They discovered the Piper oil field in 1973. Production started with 250,000 barrels per day and later increased to 300,000 barrels per day. Piper Alpha was initially used as an oil platform, but was later converted to add gas production in 1980. This conversion is really important for later, so keep that in mind. Originally, Piper Alpha was designed for oil. Later on, it transitioned to a natural gas production platform. And that's where it all went wrong. Indeed it did. <laughs> Nicole, tell us some more about Piper Alpha and the platforms that were operating in the North Sea. There were three platforms from Piper, Claymore, and the Tartan oil fields, which were connected to an oil terminal via a series of pipelines. So a pipeline ran from Claymore, and then a separate pipeline ran from Tartan, both connecting to Piper Alpha, and then Piper Alpha distributed back to the mainland from there. In late 1988, the rig was undergoing major construction, maintenance, and upgrade work. The Piper Alpha failure occurred on the evening of July 6, 1988, and is known as the deadliest offshore oil industry disaster to date, and one of the costliest man-made catastrophes ever. Unfortunately, of the 226 on board, 167 people died. The cost of the accident was 1.7 billion pounds, or 3.4 million US dollars, and that doesn't include the fact that Piper Alpha represented 10% of North Sea production. So when you when you add in the loss of tax revenue, the cost was even greater. So why don't we jump into the timeline here and actually discuss what happened? Uh, so July 6, 1988, early in the day, sometime before 6 p.m., a worker had taken out a pressure safety valve from a condensate pump, specifically condensate pump A for routine maintenance. Alonzo, can you tell us a little bit what condensate is for those of us that are not yeah. in oil and gas? <laughs> no problem. Uh, in this case, think of it as condensate is kind of like the liquid part of natural gas. So it's it has a heavier molecular weight. And in this case for Piper Alpha, I believe it was propane. Often it's pentane, butane, propane. But yeah, think of it as really just a liquid natural gas. So there were two condensate pumps and pump A had the safety valve removed by this worker for routine maintenance. Now, what was important to note is that he wasn't able to finish the maintenance on this safety valve during his shift. So he had to leave it for the next day. So what he did was placed a blind flange, a flat plate on the open end of the pipe, the pump, and he hand tightened it only. And when I say hand tightened, I mean, he literally used his fingers to tighten it. The inquiry that looked into it determined that this was the only possible way for the gas that leaked eventually to have done so. So if he had tightened it with a tool, it wouldn't have blown off or less likely? It, and yeah, less likely probably wouldn't have had as much condensate leaking as quickly as it did. So what happened though also is when he didn't finish his job for that day and had to leave it for the next day, he didn't actually communicate that to anyone on the night shift. The night shift wasn't aware that the safety valve hadn't been put back on pump A. This seems like it could cause an issue. Just a little one. <laughs> yeah. This is where the permit to work system comes in. 
So Piper Alpha had a system called Permit to Work, where workers in for th things like maintenance and all that would fill out permits for the job. And then these permits theoretically would make their way to the appropriate box or location so that the workers for the next shift would know what was going on. Uh, the permit that was filled out for this job, specifically permit number 23434, they actually were able to recover one copy of the permit later on from the bottom of the sea. It was never seen by the next shift. Somehow it was in a box that was closer to the valve and not in the area where the people who would eventually turn on the other pump would be. This seems like a huge oversight in, in the permitting process. So they, they have a system in place that obviously people are signing out permits, somebody's reviewing them, but it, it sounds like they have, they have permits that are located in a central location, but they're not, you know, there's not a copy of it in, in the location where the physical work would, would be being done. Yeah, it's, a, it's one of the flaws that was determined by this permit to work system. Overall, the Cullen Inquiry, which was the inquiry that was commissioned afterwards to investigate this disaster, they found that the system itself, one, poorly executed, but also flawed from the outset. And, and it was, like I said, one of the common failures at Piper Alpha at this time was this lack of communication. The fact that no one specifically communicated with the next shift what was going on but also that these permits were somewhat location-based and not cross-referenced to each other. So just remembering that this is in 1988 and before cell phones existed, not that there's self-service out there, but I'm just curious today, obviously there's been a lot of other changes. Are these permit systems uh, automated? Is, are they done through on a computer so that you can pull up all the active permits on an entire rig in one spot? I think it's safe to say they're they're more centralized now. You wouldn't see this location-based permitting, but I'm not positive as how automated they are. I still I'm pretty sure it's still a lot of paper. Fair enough. Before we move on, can you talk a little bit about how far apart the valve and the pump would be? Just because I'm, you know, I deal with smaller mechanical rooms, so I can see all of the equipment from almost one vantage point usually, unless it's a really really big room. So how how far away are we talking? So where the safety valve was removed would not have been immediately obvious to where the actual pump was controlled from. So you they wouldn't have been able to see it. So as far as the people, the night shift was concerned, this job had never happened. They they didn't hear about it. They didn't see a permit for it. And they couldn't see it. Yeah, That's a lot of things that are working against them in, in this scenario. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh like I said, it was a confluence of a lot of factors that made this disaster really bad that night. But also that day, uh, the firefighting systems had also been put under manual control. Now, here's another issue that made the disaster deadlier than it needed to be. See, in the summer months, divers would be in the water around the platforms doing work for about half the day, 12 hours. And for some reason on Piper Alpha, when the divers were in the water, they would turn off the automated fire suppression systems and leave on the manual ones only. The reason was uh, there's a seawater intake for the automatic fire suppression system. So you didn't want one of the divers being sucked in all of a sudden, because in all likelihood it would have killed one of the divers. Which makes a ton of sense to, you know, revert your system to manual control when there's divers in the water. I mean, I, I can certainly see the premise, the safety premise for reverting this to manual control. It makes sense if you think about it that way, but what you have to remember is the real danger was when the divers were within four or five meters of the water intakes. So to leave off a fire suppression system for 12 hours a day for months at a time, imagine if they did that for a building where all of a sudden the automatic fire system was just turned off for half the day and someone had to switch it on manually. Yeah. And in, in a fire situation, um, you really want a lot of your automated systems to work because if it's... If it's in a manual mode, somebody's got to identify that there's a fire or respond to an alarm bell and flip some switches. And I, I assume that the pumps would have to get back up to pressure. So um, th there's probably a better way of solving this situation. But unfortunately, the pumps were in manual control when, when this Piper Alpha incident happened. So uh, the systems being off in a building is not uncommon during construction, especially when they're working on the system, but they are required to do fire watch. So depending on what the risk is and what the building is, sometimes that fire watch is just 
other contractors on site or the sprinkler contractor being on site you know there's lots of people there if it's left off overnight they have to bring in security to do fire watch to address a fire should one occur i think the other important thing here to talk about is how to turn on manual mode because my understanding is that the manual activation for the sprinkler system was in the control room which was one of the first areas to go when the explosion occurred yeah that was one of the big problems is that explosion took out that control room right at the beginning which took out so many systems which is why exactly the fire suppression system wasn't turned on and of course the automatic one was turned off yeah and i think one other interesting thing that well that i thought was interesting was that the claymore platform which remember there's there's three platforms kind of in close area it hadn't adopted this procedure so the claymore platform only changed the fire system to manual when the divers were close to the intake so they had already altered their procedure to keep their sprinkler system in automatic all the time except when divers were close by and it's unfortunate that piper alpha didn't do the same yeah that's sad that's one of the sad parts is that for whatever reason piper alpha just had these procedures that again made this disaster so much deadlier than it needed to be yeah and like a lot of the failures we cover you know we've we've talked about a couple of the items so far there's more uh, so there's so many factors at play a lot with a lot of these failures it's really rare that one thing goes wrong and then there's catastrophic failure that's not impossible but it's much more rare usually there's a series of things that go wrong all of which are preventable almost always and you know, had any of those worked out differently, the the outcome could have been much better, uh, which is, again, really unfortunate. Moving along in the timeline for this incident, between 945 and 955, construction workers discover that pump B is blocked. And pump B was providing all of the power supply for all of the construction tools and all the equipment that was was needed for the construction that they were doing on the platform. The workers went through the maintenance documents to see if they could start pump A, but they didn't find any sort of valve permit for pump A. And from what we've read, it seems that they actually did take a fairly diligent look for permits that related to pump A. Remember, the permits are stored in two separate locations. They looked through the box of permits in the control room. They didn't see anything for pump A, so they assumed that they could start pump A up. So around 9.55, not knowing that there's an issue with the valve on pump A, they start the pump. And spoiler alert, the hand flange doesn't hold and gas starts spewing out at high pressure. This draws a bunch of attention, triggers alarms, and it ignited and exploded pretty quickly and before anyone could really react. The explosion blew through a firewall made of 2.5 meters by 1.5 meter panels that were bolted together. And one of the panels ruptured another liquid gas line and started another fire. So remember from the beginning of the episode, Brian said that Piper Alpha was originally designed for oil production, not gas. And so these firewalls separating the compartments were only designed for oil fires and they were not updated when they added gas production to the rig. So they weren't able to handle this gas explosion I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Alonzo, those walls folded pretty fast. Yeah. What the Cullen Inquiry actually found out later on was that those firewalls, while they're excellent against fire and high levels of heat, they were very weak against explosion. In fact, it didn't take a big explosion to destroy those walls. So that explosion, that initial explosion, Piper Alpha just essentially ripped those walls apart. So the Piper Alpha rig operated a production first mentality and they had a pretty negligent safety culture, as you can see. So they never retrofitted those walls for gas operation, which is a really, really unfortunate thing. Seems pretty straightforward to me. I realize there's extra cost with it, but the cost of losing this rig was a lot more and really embarrassing for the owner. So I don't. to me, you spend the extra money and you do it right the first time. I, this seems so, so simple. I think there was an issue at the company level that for some reason they didn't believe explosion was as likely as fire, which now we now know doesn't make sense, especially when gas is involved. Because once you have gas, it's very explosive. So you're not just dealing with fire. Yeah. But I, yeah. So to be, yeah, to be fair to them, it's 1988. They, we know a lot more now than we knew back then. Did they know enough to do it properly? Yes. But we still know more now than they did then. At 10.04, 
The control room and the radio room, which were next to the production modules and were evacuated shortly before, they were destroyed. And this was a big issue because there really was no protocol for an emergency without the control room. So at this point, the offshore installation manager, the OIM, theoretically is in charge, but begins to panic and doesn't really do an excellent job of leading his people. Isn't there normally a backup control room? Like I would have expected there would be almost a duplicate control room in another area that it's almost never used. It's regularly tested, so they know it functions, but it's almost never used so that if the first one gets blown up, the, the other one can still work. Is that, do you know if that happens? It doesn't appear that this was the case on Piper Alpha. You know, I've, I haven't read anything or seen anything about there being a backup control room for Piper Alpha. I do know after the initial explosion and when the control room operator came to, he hit the rig shutdown. So a lot of the systems shut down because that was his training to do so. It looks like Piper Rose Alpha is not designed for the control room just being destroyed. That's going to be a difficult scenario, I think, when you do have an explosion or, or an event that takes out the control room, you know, a, a place that probably should be more reinforced than other parts of the rig, just because if you lose that control room, you largely lost your ability to deal with the situation as it comes up. I mean, we see that a lot of the electrical power, some of the systems and the lighting and the PA systems got knocked out in this explosion. And not having a duplicate control room or, lot, or not having redundancy in some of these systems, it does lead to further issues with evacuation and further issues with firefighting and, and just compounds the situation more than what it, what it needs to be compounded. Uh, yeah, that was the big thing about losing that control room is that really they weren't able to alert the rest of the workers on the rig that of the emergency happening. So... You got to remember, this is the night shift that's now on. So the vast majority of the Piper Alpha workers are actually in the accommodation module. They didn't hear anything over the PA systems. You know, the gas alarms weren't functioning. So really, they're woken up by this explosion and congregated and stayed for the most part in the accommodation module, at least at the beginning. And it's 10 o'clock at night, so it's dark out. And I just think that adds an extra layer of complication. You can't, your visibility is decreased. Yeah. So at 10.05 p.m., approximately 10 minutes after the initial explosion, nearby search and rescue stations were alerted and a plane and helicopter set out for Piper Alpha. A minute later at 10.06, the fire ruptured another pipe in another section and 1,200 barrels of oil spilled onto the deck and ignited almost immediately, creating a black plume of smoke. What the bad thing about that oil, that diesel being ignited, was that big black plume of smoke that you can see some video and image pictures of the actual Piper Alpha disaster. And that smoke, what it did is it prevented the helicopter from the rescue ship from landing. So it could never actually evacuate any of the people in the accommodation module, but it also prevented people from reaching the lifeboats. And quite a few people died from smoke inhalation on Piper Alpha. So that smoke was really one of the big killers on that disaster. Yeah, I think that's something that's, often forgotten or at least something I hadn't considered when I first started thinking about and looking into fires is that the smoke does a lot more damage than you expect it to and it does a lot more damage than the fire itself so you know it's on this one on this failure as well but also in general the smoke traditionally kills more people than the fire itself at 1020, the Tartan gas line ruptured at Piper Alpha. So remember, the Tartan and the Claymore rigs both had pipelines to Piper Alpha. And at this point, because they weren't really able to sound an alarm, those pipelines are still functional. So at you know, 1020, 25 minutes after the ex initial explosion, the Tartan gas line ruptures. When the pipeline ruptured, it released a lot of flammable gas at high pressure every second and ignited a massive fireball. Yeah, actually, if you go on YouTube, you can actually see the Tartan pipeline gas line explosion. And it is impressive just how big it was. It basically engulfed the entire platform. What needs to be remembered also is that because even though the Mayday from Piper Alpha was sounded at 10.04, the other two platforms just kept producing. So really, like you said, they kept feeding gas essentially into Piper Alpha. Which also seems silly 
so the tartan one didn't last very long the claymore one lasted at least an hour before they finally shut it down which is ridiculous that seems like you'd stop that immediately yeah it was one of the weaknesses of that whole uh, say company cultural weaknesses they didn't quite understand that those three platforms formed a system so they had actually never trained on what would happen if something like that happened on one of the platforms how it would affect the other two and what should be done in that case so that's why the other two platforms just kept producing they just assumed piper would take care of the issue i feel the procedures have changed a little bit uh, you know since piper alpha happened or there'd, there'd be much more automation in you know shut down if there was a, a large pressure change or a large temperature change um, just the evolution of control systems and automated control systems and SCADA systems i think would have changed the outcome of this disaster you know quite a bit but but let's just the Piper Alpha is on fire and no one thinks to stop sending gas to it. Yeah, I again, I think, yeah, it's just one of those company culture things where they didn't want to stop production. And so then they just assumed Piper Alpha would take care of it. They would be able to handle it. Which is silly because had they stopped it and closed the valve on their end, they actually probably would have lost less production because when it exploded, they lost all of that to see. Yeah. At 10.30 p.m., the Theros, a large semi-submersible firefighting diving rescue and accommodation vessel. And if your case, you're wondering what that is, you can Google it for MSV Theros, but it's really just a floating platform. It arrived at Piper Alpha. It was nearby. And so it arrived at Piper Alpha, but its water cannon was so powerful that it would injure, kill anyone hit by that cannon. So they had to use extreme, with extreme caution. The Tharos was equipped with a hospital, set up a triage area on the helideck to receive survivors. It Theoretically, that's the helicopter from the Tharos had launched pretty soon after the explosion. But of course, it couldn't do anything. It couldn't land on the Piper Alpha to evacuate anyone. So really, all it could do was look at what was happening on Piper Alpha. So at 10.55 p.m., another pipeline fails. So the other pipeline and explodes, shooting flames 90 meters into the air. This explosion destroyed one of the fast rescue vessels, an FRC. So once they realized that they couldn't use a helicopter to evacuate anyone, they sent out their fast rescue vessels to get as many people from the sea as possible. And one of those rescue vessels was hit by from debris from this explosion, and all but one of the crew and all the survivors were killed. So at this point, finally, the Claymore rig stops pumping oil, something they should have done immediately after the May Day. So the 20,000 ton steel platform of the Piper Alpha melted over the next 80 minutes. The standby vessels for Piper Alpha, which was Silver Pit, was also the standby vessel in the Ecofisk field when the Alexander Keelan Flotel capsized on March 27, 1980. We'll likely cover this on an upcoming episode. I'm always looking for stuff to add to the list. So we know there were a lot of problems here and let's recap them so first we've got operation issues with respect to the work permit communication which as we know was poor at best we know that the rig was initially designed for oil production and when gas production was added they didn't really change the construction of the rig which is a really big oversight in my opinion there was no contingency plan for an emergency with the loss of the control room and there was also no contingency plan for a loss of one of the rigs that operated in a system. Most of the personnel that had authority to order an evacuation were killed during the first explosion, which, and maybe correct me if I'm wrong, it seems like, shouldn't anyone be able to order an evacuation? So what happened was the OIM, the offshore installation manager, unfortunately, the Cullen inquiry is critiques him quite a bit. And unfortunately, he passed away in this disaster. What he did is, and he had seen the smoke and the fire, so he should have known that the helicopters were never going to land on the heli deck. But rather than telling his people to escape from the accommodation module, to jump into the sea at and from essentially anywhere, I mean, some people jumped into the sea even from the heli deck, which was, if I'm not mistaken, 175 feet in the air, I believe. So they would rather chance that small percentage of surviving that fall into the sea then stay in the accommodation module. But the offshore installation manager, uh, it's uh, you probably just panicked and reverted back to his training, was told as many people to stay 
in the accommodation modules as possible. And as we now know, because they sheltered in place, essentially, that's where a good majority of them died of smoke inhalation. Yes, we do know. UK folks, I don't know why you guys keep sheltering in place. It's a terrible idea. Don't do it. Exit, please. Evacuate the building or the rig or whatever. So Alonzo, I, I take it since a, a bunch of people died basically sheltering in place that in the accommodation module, there was no, you know, gas mask or, you know, smoke inhalation shield or, or you know, some sort of preventative measure just to buy additional time if they were going to shelter in place. Actually, uh, this is kind of where the lack of training came into play. So what happened is a lot of people kept opening the doors to see what was going on. Some people broke windows so they could escape. Others left fire doors permanently open so that those who were escaping the accommodation module could escape. So really what happened is that there was a bunch of paths for smoke to get into the accommodation module. It wasn't sealed off. And really, that was because of that lack of safety training for the men on Piper Alpha that kind of led to these kind of decisions. It sounds like, though, that, you know, sheltering in place and sealing the module, I think I don't I think it would have just delayed it. I don't think it would have saved them. And I and I say that because the entire rig sunk shortly after. Uh, so maybe it would have saved them long enough to be rescued. But I I don't know. I don't know, hindsight's twenty twenty, but I don't know how much better the results would have been. No, you're correct. There's no way a helicopter is going to land on that heli deck to get them out. As we know, that accommodation module sank into the sea. They recovered quite a few bodies from that module. Yeah. So, so you're right. Really, what the offshore installation manager should have told him once he saw all that smoke and fire, he should have told him to escape from the rig as quickly as possible. Yeah, and and then one other major item as we talked about was the firefighting system was a manual mode. And when the control room was destroyed, the ability to turn that system on was pretty much gone and they were not able to fight the fire with a sprinkler system, which is unfortunate. So as with all failures of this nature, there was an inquiry which released a full report. I believe that's the Cullen report in November, 1990. And the report found that the initial liquid natural gas leak was caused by the maintenance work being carried out on pump A and the associated safety valve, which we've talked about. And the rig operator was found guilty of having inadequate maintenance and safety procedures, but no criminal charges were ever filed. And to be fair, this person thought they were following procedure. So they turned, they took the valve out of service. They left a permit. They could have left a permit near the pump. Yes, it could have gone better, but... From what it sounds like, this rig operator did follow the procedure that was in place at the time. That procedure was just extremely flawed. Yeah, there was certainly no malicious intent of him putting on a blind flange and hand tightening it. It was the end of his shift. He probably wanted to go grab some food, go hang out in his room. And yeah, like Nicole said, the permitting system the permitting system had some flaws in it. And unfortunately, a substantial number of people died largely related to flaws in the permitting system. The report that Nicole mentioned, it made 106 recommendations for changes to North Sea safety procedures. 37 changes were related to operating equipment. 32 were related to relaying information to platform personnel. 25 were related to the design of the platforms. And 12 were related to information of emergency services. The responsibility to implement these recommendations was on the regulators, operators, industry as a whole, and by the standby ship operators. Safety oversight was shifted from the Department of Energy to the Health and Safety Executive as having one group oversee production and safety was a conflict of interest. So this is something we kind of saw in the Deepwater Horizon, and it's not necessarily that they weren't separate. They weren't, you know, they weren't one group overseeing production and safety. There was a separate group for safety, but they worked so closely with the group for production and they knew each other so well that they overlooked some of the things. And so they you know, they trusted that the operators were doing what they said and that production was following the rules and they weren't doing as thorough of checks as they could have. Um, so we saw some similar issues there. And that's something we talked about in that Deepwater Horizon episode, which I believe is episode 25, is that they could have learned a lot from Piper Alpha and they didn't. And there's a lot of procedural lessons here to be learned. And there are still 
rig failures and accidents that are happening that don't need to happen if we just listen to what happened at Piper Alpha and we pay attention to what we're doing and we implement all of these recommendations. So in 1992, the Offshore Safety Act was enacted. And this essentially was the codification and implementation of a lot of those Cullen Inquiry recommendations. And also, as we know, there is an insurance claim of about $1.4 billion USD submitted. And so this process revealed like serious weaknesses about how insurers track their potential exposures and their procedures were also reformed. There is a rec buoy marking the remains of the Piper Alpha. And there's also a memorial monument with the names of the deceased in Hazelhead Park in Aberdeen, Scotland. And finally, to my fellow engineers, after having studied Piper Alpha, uh, you come with the feeling that really complacency at a company and individual level was one of the main reasons this disaster happened. So I would say beware of falling into that trap because it's an easy one to fall into. Excellent advice. Excellent advice. So there you have it. A repurposed offshore drilling platform was only revised for production with little thought on safety and evacuation. On top of that, significant operational and safety procedure issues made the risk of accidents high and the chance of survival low. Lessons were learned from the Piper Alpha disaster, but they didn't really sink in, seeing as we still have offshore rig disasters like Deepwater Horizon that we covered in episode 25. Also, that was a really enjoyable movie with Marky Mark. Just going to say that. For photos, sources, and an episode summary from this week's episode, head to failurology.ca. If you're enjoying what you're hearing, please rate, review, and subscribe to Failurology so more people can find us. If you want to chat with us, our Twitter handle is at Failurology. You can email us at thefailurologypodcast at gmail.com. You can connect with us on LinkedIn. Or if you're on our Patreon page, you can message us right in the Patreon app. Check out the show notes for links to all of these. Thanks everyone for listening and tune into the next episode where we'll talk about L'Ambiance Plaza, the collapse of a lift slab construction building in Bridgeport, Connecticut during construction. Bye everyone. Talk soon.